Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So often when I talk to people about rogues and I call them a martial class, I get told that rogues aren't a martial class, they're a skills class. Skills are what rogues do and leave martial classes to fighters and barbarians and rangers and the like. Now I just don't understand that mode of thinking. I mean Bard is clearly a skills class too, but they're obviously still a spellcasting class. Rogues aren't really a spellcasting class. Even if you take a spellcasting subclass, you're not getting a lot of spells. So they're clearly a martial class. They're using weapons in combat. And when you're using weapons in combat, I figure you should be able to do one of a few different things. Either you should be really strong at defending the party, or you should be really strong at doing damage, or you should be a little bit of both. Uh, and I think that with most martial characters, it ends up being a little bit of both. With a rogue, though, I think what happens is your defense isn't all that strong. You're wearing light armor. You don't have a shield. You're working off a d8 hit points. So defensively, making a tanky kind of character with a rogue is difficult unless you're going to multi-class. So I figure rogues should be really good at doing damage. And they are. Rogues can be excellent at doing damage despite the fact that they don't get extra attack as long as we make some reasonably good decisions. So today I'm going to show you how to make a straight class rogue that just does good damage and maintains good damage for 20 levels. But before we do that, I want to thank some of my patrons. I have a Patreon. If you like what I do, please check it out. The link is in the video description. Today I want to call out some of my Archmage level patrons. These people really help me maintain this channel. I want to thank today Dewey Cheatham and Howe, James Sprague, John Matera, Jonathan Haynes, Kurt Mageddon, Kurt G, Lyric, and Matt. Thank you all so much for your continued support. Thank you to all my patrons and thank you to all my viewers. So now let's make an arcane trickster. So the arcane trickster we're going to make today I'm calling Stabby McStabberson. Uh, now, when it comes to race, again, I mentioned this last week, when people talk about optimizers, they often talk about always using the variant human. I don't think we always need to be using the variant human with optimization. I think the variant human is really good. Uh, getting that feat at level 1 really gives you a boost, especially at the very low levels. But that doesn't mean we have to use the variant human in order to be effective. So. Today again, I want to go for a different race. Uh, I considered going with Halfling again. I went with Halfling with my Eldritch Knight build, and it ended up still being able to be effective. But I wanted to go a little bit different again today. So today I'm thinking, let's make this character a Gnome. So Gnome is a good race for Arcane Trickster. We're mixing Intelligence with either Constitution or Dexterity, depending on our subrace. Now, I think, generally speaking, of course, you're better off going with Dexterity, and that means a Forest Gnome. Of course, when I think of Gnomes, I'm not thinking about this. I'm thinking more about this guy. Wait, what's he doing with his hand? Okay, I'm thinking about this guy. One way or the other, I'm thinking, definitely white beard, red hat. No matter how you envision your Gnome, they have a number of nice abilities. As I mentioned, we're going to get the plus two to Intelligence, plus one to Dexterity, that's just where we want it with an Arcane Trickster. In addition, we're going to get Dark Vision, always useful, especially for a Rogue. Gnome Cunning, which is really good. Advantage on Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma saving throws against Magic. This comes up all the time, especially Wisdom. Then we're going to get a Free Cantrip. We're going to get Minor Illusion. This goes nicely with our Magical Concept. And then the ability to speak with small beasts. Obviously, we will be going with Rogue as our class. The proficiencies I've chosen to start with are Perception, Stealth, Acrobatics, and Athletics. And we're going to grab Expertise in Perception and Stealth. When you are making a Rogue character, the premier feature, of course, is Sneak Attack. This is what is going to make your character effective in combat. In gameplay, I see way too many Rogues attack 
without using sneak attack. So they're attacking without advantage, they're attacking an enemy that has no allies next to it, and they're doing lousy damage. This is completely unnecessary. Sneak attack is easy to get. Your rogue can choose to use sneak attack with pretty much every attack they're going to make in an entire campaign. Attack from hidden, or attack somebody that an ally is next to, or hold your action until an ally is next to your target. With the Forest Gnome using point buy, we can start with an 8 strength, 16 dexterity, 14 constitution, 16 intelligence, 12 wisdom, and an 8 charisma. So I've really focused on dexterity and intelligence here. So you can play an arcane trickster that's perfectly effective doing good damage in combat and have an 8 intelligence. I've decided to go with a high intelligence with this character because we can mix in some pretty effective control spells with an arcane trickster and I want to do that. I want to have that option and if I want to have that option I need to have at least a 14 intelligence. The background, I didn't think about it too hard, I just threw Gambler in there. It's going to give me deception and insight. Now I should talk about damage for a bit. The damage we can expect with this arcane trickster is going to start out good and it's going to remain good, actually quite good, all the way through. The scaling here is really nice, and the gap between our damage and the baseline just increases and increases. To those who don't know, I use a baseline which would be basically, if you made a Warlock and you took Eldritch Blast, maxed out your Charisma, took Agonizing Blast, and threw the Hex spell down, this is what you would get, the blue line there. When I talk about monks, people tell me the baseline is too high, but when I make builds, I usually find it's pretty easy to beat, and we see that the Arcane Trickster just destroys it. Now, this character is going to be using a Rapier. Now, I occasionally get told by people that they get frustrated with 5th edition because they don't want their rogue to be using a Rapier. They would rather them be using a Dagger, but they feel punished for doing so. But honestly, if you want to make a rogue using a Dagger, that works perfectly well too. We end up with a damage basis that looks closer to this. Still really effective damage. It is slightly lower than if we used a rapier, and that's why I'm recommending the rapier. But if dagger's your jam, you can totally make it work and be effective with damage for 20 levels. So until we become an arcane trickster, the first two levels of this build, I am going to recommend that we use two short swords in combat. This will use the two weapon fighting rules and what will happen is we can use our bonus action to attack with the second short sword. We don't add our dexterity modifier to the damage but that's not the reason we're doing it. The main reason we're doing it is because if we miss with our primary attack we have another chance to apply the sneak attack damage. If you don't want to use two short swords, you can use two daggers and you would just be looking at the second graph I was showing. And as we know, the damage of this character will be pretty good. We also have a reasonable amount of skills. So what are the weaknesses here? Well, 10 starting hit points is okay for first level, but it's not great. And a 14 armor class is a poor starting armor class. So when you've got a 14 armor class and 10 hit points, there is some risk involved. This kind of character is one I've always called a glass cannon. It's all about doing the damage, but it just can't take it. So at third level, we're going to switch to using one weapon. That is going to free up our bonus action on our turn. The main thing we'll be doing with our bonus action is cunning action. This is acquired at second level, but we're really going to be able to take more advantage of it once we get to third level. This means we can use our bonus action to dash, disengage, or hide. Generally speaking, if you are using your short bow because the enemies are at range, you want to use your cutting action for the hide action. The hide action is what's going to give you advantage on that next attack. Now, if you already have advantage on that attack because maybe you received the help action, you can take the hide action at the end of your turn. That's going to help protect you until your next turn. Now, when we are in melee, disengage is the one we're probably going to be using the most. Disengage is very important for rogues, because rogues who try to duke it out with an enemy are often going to find their hit points draining fast. For our archetype, we'll be taking Arcane Trickster, of course. This is going to give us spell casting, and the spell casting for Arcane Trickster is pretty weak. I mean, it is a very slow progressing spell casting, 
but they do get some nice abilities that make it so that the spells they do cast are really effective. We also get Mage Hand Ledger Domain. This is a way to improve the Mage Hand cantrip, which we are going to get automatically with Arcane Trickster. So we're going to get three starting cantrips. One of them is the Mage Hand cantrip automatically. Mage Hand's already a good spell. It's a basically limited telekinesis, and there's all kinds of uses for it, even without Mage Hand Ledger Domain. For us, we're especially good with it. It's a very nice cantrip for us to have. But because we are going to be playing a melee character and one that's relying on doing damage for contributing in combat, our other two cantrips, I think our best choices are Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade. Just like with Eldritch Knights, I think these are the right way to go. Now Green Flame Blade, what I really like about it is that we always know when that secondary damage is going to occur. So you have an enemy, they have another enemy beside them, you can use Green Flame Blade and you can be 100% certain you'll get your secondary damage. What I don't like about Green Flame Blade is the fire damage. A lot of creatures are resistant to fire, some are immune to fire, uh, so it, the damage type is a little less reliable. But the ability to know when that secondary damage is going to occur is very nice. Now, Booming Blade does Thunder Damage. Thunder Damage is far more reliable than Fire Damage. The disadvantage of Booming Blade is we don't always know when the secondary damage is going to come into effect. Because we do our Booming Blade and that enemy doesn't move, so we don't get our secondary damage. We don't necessarily know when that enemy is going to move. What we can do with the Rogue is we can make it more likely they will move. And the way we would do that is we would move up to an enemy, we would attack them, then we would use our cunning action to disengage, and then we would back up from them. Now, if that enemy wants to continue attacking that party tank that's next to you, that's fine. And that's actually exactly what we would want. But if that enemy wants to attack the more squishy rogue, they have to move to get to us now. And when they move to get to us, they would trigger that secondary damage. It's also worth mentioning, because we chose to go with Forest Gnome, we're going to start the game with Minor Illusion. This is a nice addition. This is one of those things that if I wasn't playing a Forest Gnome, I might give up one of those attack cantrips in order to get. But because I am playing a Forest Gnome, I get to have them all. Minor Illusion is going to give me a ton of utility uses and a few combat uses. I have an entire video devoted to Minor Illusion. I'll link it in the video description if you're interested. Now I'm going to be able to choose three first level spells and two of them have to be either illusion or enchantment. The first one I'm going to choose is Disguise Self. As a rogue, I just think this is a very useful spell. Being able to disguise yourself with one action is going to fit in with the kinds of things that rogues normally end up doing. Second spell I'm going to take is an enchantment spell. That's Tasha's Hideous Laughter. Tasha's Hideous Laughter is a pretty strong control spell for a first level spell. Target makes a saving throw. If they fail that saving throw, they fall prone and they're incapacitated. And this could potentially last up to a minute. Now I'm not huge on the spells that provide a saving throw and if they make it, nothing happens. But if we're talking about first level control spells, we just can't set the bar as high. And Tasha's Hideous Laughter, for what it is, is pretty effective. Also remember that with the Rogue, eventually we're going to be able to provide disadvantage on that saving throw. It's going to make a spell like Tasha's Hideous Laughter that can remain very useful even at higher levels more likely to be effective. And Find Familiar is the obvious choice for me for the any spell school spell that we can choose. Find Familiar, we can't cast it as a ritual, that's fine. We will gladly use our spell slot on Find Familiar. This is going to vastly improve our ability to scout. And scouting is part of what a rogue often ends up doing. It's going to improve our ability to spy. It's going to improve our ability to observe. And finally, it's going to improve our abilities in combat because we can use that familiar to set up the help action. The help action for a rogue is massive because they are making a single attack and that attack, if it gets advantage, automatically qualifies for sneak attack. So find familiar, plus Rogue is just a winning combination in every aspect. So at level 3, we're going to put our short swords away and pull our rapier. We're going to be attacking once around with the rapier, hopefully with the help action from our familiar to give us advantage, and we're going to be using Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade. 
and if we're using Booming Blade, we're going to be using our bonus action to disengage and try to push that enemy to come towards us and trigger that secondary damage. If we are stuck at range, this character is okay at range. We're just going to be using our bonus action to hide and then pop up and make a short bow attack. If you want, you can switch to a light crossbow. It'll mean an extra, but a point of damage if you hit. But this character will do more damage if they can be in melee. So when we get to 5th level, we're going to be able to improve our defense somewhat. First thing with our ability score improvement, I'm going to recommend a bonus to dexterity. Uh, now we could boost our defense in other ways as well. We could take moderately armored, that would let us use a shield. But dexterity helps us in so many other ways. It helps us with our to hit rolls, it helps us with our damage, it helps our initiative, it helps our saving throws, and it's going to help our defense by increasing our armor class. And there are a ton of feats we could take here. Feats that would really boost this character. And I'm just saying dexterity is probably as good as any of them. But still, if you wanted to go with moderately armored, if you wanted to go with lucky, if you wanted to go with resilient constitution, if you wanted to go with warcaster, these are all still good choices. So the other thing we're going to get level 5 is uncanny dodge. And this is a nice boost to our defense. It uses our reaction. It's pretty much the first thing that's going to use our reaction unless we're holding our action or something and what happens is if you're hit with an attack use your reaction and you can have the damage uh, now the disadvantage here is that it only works against a single attack so if you are attacked multiple times and you're hit multiple times the each time you're hit the effect of uncanny dodge becomes less and less if you hit once in a round it's really good if you're hit several times in a round it's not great but it is another boost to our defense, and we are looking for boosts for our defense, so I'm still glad to have it on the character. We're going to get one final first level spell, and this again is limited to illusion or enchantment. I'm going to recommend Silent Image. Silent Image is a versatile spell, and again, this is going to be something that primarily we would probably be using for utility. Silent Image actually pairs very nicely with Minor Illusion as well, because Minor Illusion can create the sound that Silent Image can't. And because Minor Illusion doesn't use concentration, they can be combined if you have two actions to set it up. Now, assuming we've been able to get Studded Leather by this time, we should be looking at an armor class of 16. This is still a pretty weak armor class, especially for 5th level, but it is at least better than a 14 armor class. What we do see is, with our skills, we're going to have a number of skills that are doing quite well, and because of things like expertise, things like perception, even though we're basing it off, a pretty moderate charisma, still looking at a plus 7 at level 5, nothing wrong with that. So looking at 7th level, this is the first point where we are going to have access to 2nd level spells. We're also going to get a couple of class features, we're going to get expertise in two additional skills, and I've chosen deception and athletics. Now some people might ask why I'm not choosing dexterity based skills, because deception is based on charisma, athletics is based off strength, both of those are 8s, and that's why I want expertise, because I'm going to be making those rolls sometimes, and expertise is going to help make up for the fact that the ability score isn't high. We can either focus on the things that are already good, or we can look at the things that aren't very good and make them better, and I tend to kind of push towards the latter. And then we're going to get evasion. This is another way to help protect our hit points. When we are subjected to an effect that provides a dexterity saving throw to take half damage, we take no damage if we succeed and half damage if we fail. Now the one thing I want to mention here is they use an example here of an ancient red dragon's fiery breath and evasion does apply against that, but just keep in mind there are dragons that provide constitution saving throws and evasion isn't going to help us at all for that. There are also spells that provide constitution saving throws to take half damage, and evasion doesn't help us against those either. So this is a limited number of effects that evasion is going to apply to. Now we are going to get our first second level spell. It is limited to being illusion or enchantment, and for me this is definitely mirror image. I just talked about picking up things that aren't as strong rather than enhancing things that are already good and so some people will be thinking why didn't you take shadow blade but my damage is already strong without shadow blade and shadow blade is not going to help my defense at all in fact shadow blade is a concentration spell and that concentration is likely to be tested mirror image is not a concentration spell and it is going to help my defense which is my weak point 
mirror image is going to take three attacks against me that might have hit and turned them into misses. That doesn't mean I'm going to be able to use mirror image all the time. Keep in mind, arcane tricksters do not have a lot of spell slots, and we are going to be using up those spell slots very quickly. If we are having an adventuring day where we are having several combats, we're going to run out of those second level slots very fast. We only have two. And mirror image is not going to last through multiple combats. In fact, mirror image can go down within the first couple rounds of combat easily enough if you're targeted with enough attacks. So I want to look at level 9 because actually a few things happen within those couple levels. First thing, we're going to get an ability score improvement. Now if you want to increase your dexterity again, that is not a bad choice at all. I have already mentioned a number of feats that you could take. Those are not bad choices at all. I'm going to choose the Sentinel feat. Now this may not be an obvious choice. In fact, I find the Sentinel feat is normally taken with fighter builds or with paladin builds. But I actually think it is a strong feat for a rogue build. There's three features of the Sentinel feat. The first is when we hit a creature with an opportunity attack, the creature's speed becomes zero for the rest of the turn. The second is Creatures provoke opportunity attacks from you even if they take the disengage action before leaving your reach. And the third thing is when a creature within 5 feet of you makes an attack against a target other than you and that target doesn't have this feat, you can use your reaction to make a melee weapon attack against the attacking creature. Now I need to first explain how using our reaction to make an attack when it's not our turn means we get another sneak attack. Sneak Attack states, once per turn you can deal an extra 1d6 damage to one creature you hit with an attack if you advantage on the attack roll. Now, when it says once per turn, keep in mind that's not once per round. One round has many, many turns, and when we make a reaction attack, usually it's not the turn where we made our sneak attack. So we can potentially apply sneak attack a second time in the same round. So if we find our rogue in melee with an enemy spellcaster, they might not want to be in melee with us because we can deliver a lot of damage, especially a lot of damage with a single hit. That can make concentration saves difficult. So an enemy spellcaster that's concentrating is probably going to want to get away from us. But doing so is going to provoke an attack of opportunity even if they use the disengage action. And that means not only are we going to get a second sneak attack on them, but in addition their movement's going to be changed to zero and they're not going to be able to escape us. But let's say we're taking on a big tough enemy. Well, what we would want to do on our turn is we would want to be moving up to a big tough enemy that we already have an ally beside. Once we do so, we're going to be making our melee attack with our sneak attack. Then we'll want to use our cunning action to disengage. And ideally, we want to be putting ourselves right in front of the squishiest member of our party. Probably the squishiest member of our party isn't us. Probably the squishiest member is a party druid, or a party wizard, or party sorcerer, or party warlock, or maybe it's something like a cleric that has a spirit guardians up with the enemy in range. One way or the other, a smart enemy is probably going to want to get at that squishy character. The first thing to note is, if they move at all, they're going to trigger the secondary damage of the Booming Blade. And then, once they get within melee range with that squishy character and attack them, we will be able to take a reaction attack against them that gets our sneak attack. Now this is not an opportunity attack, so if we took something like Warcaster, we wouldn't be able to do a Booming Blade with it or anything like that. But that's not the main reason here. The main reason is to get our sneak attack a second time, and that it would do. So how many additional sneak attacks is Sentinel going to give us? Well, I think most rounds of combat, it's not going to provide you an additional sneak attack. But it will once in a while. And in my damage calculations, my assumption was maybe once a combat. The other thing that's going to happen in these couple levels is starting at 9th level, we're going to get Magical Ambush. This is one of the premier abilities of an Arcane Trickster. We can provide disadvantage on a saving throw against a creature we're hidden from when we cast a spell. Now at this level, that's probably going to be Tasha's Hideous Laughter. And Tasha's is one of those spells that if the enemy makes their saving throw, nothing happens. So getting disadvantage on that saving throw makes it a lot more likely for it to work. Now at 8th level, we're going to be able to choose a spell from any school. Uh, and I'm going to recommend Web 
Now, Web is not something that's going to take any advantage from our Magical Ambush, but it's still just a really strong second level spell, a really strong control spell, and something we can do against multiple enemies, because pretty much everything we have so far is really good against single enemies, but we don't really have anything to deal with massive numbers of enemies. Web is that first thing we get that is effective against groups of enemies. Now I'm going to start skipping a few extra levels here. Let's go to level 13. 13 is a big level for this character. Now rogues get an additional ability score improvement at level 10. And that ability score improvement, I'm going to recommend we take Resilient Constitution. Our Constitution save has been a plus 2 all this time. And we're now getting into the point where we're casting concentration spells, starting once we get the web spell at level 8. I mean, occasionally we'll cast Tasha's Hideous Laughter. Most of the spells we've been casting up to now are not requiring concentration. But that is going to change. And so we want to boost up that constitution saving throw. But it's more than just concentration. Constitution saving throws in D&D come up all the time. And so when we take something like Warcaster, although it boosts our concentration saves, it doesn't boost all those other saves. Resilient Constitution is going to boost all those saves. We're going to get Reliable Talent at level 11. This is huge for a character that is using a lot of skills. Whenever we make an ability check that lets us add a proficiency bonus, we can treat a d20 roll of 9 or lower as a 10. This is going to make a lot of skills that are kind of our specialty automatic successes in many situations. At 12th level, we're going to get another ability score improvement. The recommendation I'm making here is let's just get our dexterity up to 20. Again, it's boosting our armor class, it's boosting our initiative, it's boosting our to hit rolls, it's boosting our damage. And finally, we're going to get Versatile Trickster. This comes in at 13th level, and what it allows us to do is use our Mage Hand in combat with a bonus action to give us advantage on an attack roll. This one is probably not going to come up as much. Because we have Find Familiar, we can often get the help action in combat, so then Versatile Trickster is not necessary. But if our Familiar dies, this gives us another option. Mage Hand is a one action cast, and after that action, we can just use our bonus action to be able to continue to do sneak attacks every turn. At 10th level, we're going to be getting an additional cantrip. I'm recommending the message cantrip. This is a method of communicating with someone secretly. And again, this just kind of fits in with what we would expect to be able to do as a rogue. At 10th and 11th level, we're going to get a couple more second level spells, which again have to be from the illusion or enchantment schools. I'm going to recommend at this point we pick up Shadow Blade. We now have boosted our concentration, so Shadow Blade is a little more reliable in that way. And if we are in a situation where we're in dim light or darkness, this is a way we can just ensure that we're going to have advantage on attacks. And one thing to remember is if we're relying on the help action to give us advantage on attack rolls, that means that if we are making a reaction attack with Sentinel, we're not getting that advantage. But with Shadow Blade, if we can be in Dim Light or Darkness, we would get advantage on those rolls as well. In addition, instead of doing 1d8 damage with our weapon, we'd be doing 2d8 damage with our weapon. And it's a reliable damage type. Very few things resistant or immune to psychic damage. Also, should we be in a situation where we've been unable to find a magical weapon, Shadow Blade is a way that we can get around resistance or immunity to non-magical damage. Though, honestly, most campaigns, you're going to find at least a magic dagger. Now, in the damage calculations I made, I didn't count on casting Shadow Blade at all. Uh, but if we do cast Shadow Blade in that combat, we do see about a 5-point increase to damage per round. With our other spell, I'd recommend probably either Hold Person or Invisibility. Uh, this is kind of a tertiary choice, and neither of those spells are likely the spells I'm going to be casting, but we are looking at limited spell schools here. And Invisibility, in terms of utility, I can totally see using. Not some I'm ever going to use in combat. Uh, I got told after my Arcane Trickster video that it was crazy not to include invisibility. It's one of the best spells for arcane tricksters. It's a necessity for a rogue. I would disagree. Most rogues don't even have access to invisibility, and they seem to be able to be rogues just fine. So obviously it's not necessary. We have a character that's already good at stealth. They can do stealth as a bonus action. Sneaking is what they do. Uh, so invisibility enhances that, but we're already actually pretty good at stealth without invisibility. 
But nevertheless, as a utility, I can totally see the advantage of having invisibility. There's certain areas you just can't hide. And when you have invisibility, you can combine your ability to not be seen with the silent movement of our stealth skill. And those do go together nicely. But the huge thing we get at 13th level is access to third level spells. And this really changes the game for us. Now, if we are playing a character that does not have a high intelligence score, it's not such a big deal. But when we are playing a character with a high intelligence score, like we are, Hypnotic Pattern is massive for us. Use your cunning action to hide, cast Hypnotic Pattern, and every single creature caught in that Hypnotic Pattern has disadvantage to their saving throw. This is a really effective control technique that can be more effective than things that the wizard does, or the sorcerer does, or the bard does. Now, our ability to do this comes very late, and we have very few slots. So we haven't suddenly turned into a control caster, but we can dip into it. And when we do, we do it effectively. And that is something I like to see in a jack-of-all-trades character, is that you don't have to be the best at anything, but when you do something that isn't your specialty, you want to be good enough at it that it's still worthwhile for you to do. And with Arcane Trickster, we get that. Hypnotic Pattern is still an effective spell at 13th level, and Hypnotic Pattern with disadvantage on everybody's saving throws is a very effective spell at this level. And although we can't do it very often, when we do it, it is going to be impactful. Now, obviously, if we're doing things like Hypnotic Pattern, that lowers our damage because we're casting a spell rather than attacking. Uh, and the damage calculations I made were just assuming attacking. So if you're doing Hypnotic Pattern, you're just changing. You're no longer doing the damage that round. Instead, we're doing effective control. And it gives this character a huge amount of versatility. The next level I consider pretty significant for this build comes at level 15. At level 14, we get Blind Sense. This is actually something that probably isn't going to come up a lot. At 14th level, if you're able to hear, you're aware of the location of any hidden or invisible creature within 10 feet of you. Now, by the rules, Normally, you're already aware of any invisible creature within 10 feet of you, unless they are using stealth. Uh, but Blind Sense would allow you to know where they are, even then. Going to come up very rarely, but maybe once in a while. Slippery Mind, though, is big, because Slippery Mind is going to give us proficiency in Wisdom saving throws. Resilient Constitution gave us proficiency in Constitution saving throws, and we started with proficiency in Dexterity saving throws. So that gives us proficiency in all three of the major saving throws. Also, at 14th level, we're going to be able to take a third level spell that is not restricted by school. The one I'm going to recommend is slow. And again, this is to take advantage of our magical ambush ability. Because slow is going to be useful in a lot of cases where hypnotic pattern isn't. Uh, in fact, if I can use hypnotic pattern effectively, it's going to be better than slow. But in the cases where I'm fighting a creature that's immune to the charm condition, or I'm all mixed up in combat with a bunch of friendly creatures, Hypnotic Pattern isn't going to work for me. But Slow will work for me, and it will still benefit from Magical Ambush. And so Slow still becomes a pretty effective way to control the battlefield. And when we're providing all the enemies disadvantage on their saving throws, it's going to have an impactful difference. Now, we want to be using this in battles where we have six enemies or more, ideally, because otherwise we're not getting the full advantage out of slow. So let's just look at the 20th level character completed. At level 16, we're going to get an ability score improvement. I'm going to recommend the lucky feat here. This could help us hit on attacks that we really wanted to hit, or have enemies miss on attacks against us, or it could give us a reroll on an important saving throw. Spell Thief comes into play at level 17. Not the greatest of 17th level abilities, uh, but I did go over it in my Arcane Trickster spell video, and if you're interested in why I think it's not terrible, go check that out. 18th level makes it so that any attack against us never has advantage as long as we're not incapacitated. At 19th level, we're going to get additional ability score improvement. I'm recommending the feat Tough. And finally, we get Stroke of Luck. I think this is a so-so capstone. It is going to allow us to turn one miss into a hit or one failed ability check into a natural 20. And we can do this once per short rest. It's not terrible, uh, but as far as 20th level abilities go, I think it's pretty mild.
We're going to get another third level spell. I'm going to recommend Fear here. Again, we're limited to Illusion or Enchantment. Fear is something that might be usable in different situations than a Hypnotic Pattern is. Cones are generally harder to place than squares, but sometimes they're the better option. Uh, it really depends on how your combat is going sometimes. You can fit that cone in, hit the enemies, and avoid your allies. And in those cases, fear is going to work better than hypnotic pattern. At 19th level, we get 4th level spells, and we need to choose from the Illusion and Enchantment school. And I think Greater Invisibility is a pretty obvious choice. Defensively, Greater Invisibility is going to give disadvantage on all attacks against us, and that is a huge defensive boost for a character that doesn't have a great defense. And then offensively, we're going to get advantage on all attacks automatically. We don't need to worry about the help action or anything like that. And then at 20th level, we're going to get one more spell. Banishment might be an option here. It's an okay control spell. Now at 20th level, it's no big deal, but at least we can provide disadvantage on the saving throw. We might want to choose Arcane Eye. That's another possibility for some scouting, but again, at 20th level, if we have any real spellcasters in our party, they've already got these kinds of spells. But remember, spellcasting isn't our specialty. Our specialty is doing damage with a sword. And once again, by 20th level, we are expecting just using the rapier with our booming blade and our occasional reaction attack, we're looking at mid-60s for damage. Even if we're using a dagger, we're looking at low 60s for damage. This is close to double the baseline, so this is really effective damage. In addition, we have some decent control options. We are excellent at skills, but we're still being able to be effective in combat, and I do think that pretty much every class in the game is capable of doing something useful outside of combat and still being useful in combat. And rogues are no exception. So for the last four weeks I've been covering Arcane Tricksters and Eldritch Knights. This is the end of that series. So next week I want to talk about the other side of the screen. I'm going to talk about DMing a little bit. So until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everyone, and I will see you next week.